Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Metaverse Podcast. I'm Mark Fernandez, and today I'm joined by Zach, Zach F. Senior, the professor of the John Wells Division of Screen and Television at the University of Southern California. Uh, I, I had a tough time with that. But how are you, Zach? I'm doing well today. Doing very well. Cool, cool. And, and we had a few little tech uh, hiccups, probably on my side, but can you hear me okay? Yep, I sure can. All right, awesome. So, Jack, um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Um, I've, I've become um, a, a, a bigger fan of your work in the last few days as I've been prepping for this interview, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to jump right into it. Um, um, what, what kind of got you uh, thinking that you could uh, take on writing as a profession? Like, where did that jump come from? between kind of being a quote unquote civilian into an actual sort of professional writer with specifically a focus on writing for the screen? Well, you know, like a lot of these things, they sort of happen by accident. Um, I, I took some writing classes at, I went to Michigan State University, took some writing classes and really found I had fun. I, I was a pre-med major and a chemistry class at 8 a.m. proved I was not gonna become a doctor. <laughs> But writing I could do because I could do it whenever I wanted and <laughs> not at 8 a.m. And I just found I just really enjoyed it. And then that led to me taking a class on making films. So to make films, you have to write films. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I came out to California. And again, I wanted to be a director as my initial goal. But, you know, you, there's no money to direct. So but you can write. It doesn't cost you anything except your paper and your time. Right. And uh, found that I enjoyed it uh, and enjoyed telling stories. And, and, and how did you get that kind of first break uh, to go from somebody who was had ambitions to be a director, figured out that you had a lot of strengths as a writer into um, the working on the original Hawaii Five-O show? You know, it, 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 you know a lot of things. It, it, it's luck and timing. Um, I had met someone at Michigan State, Anderson House, uh, who lived in California, and he was a graduate student. I was undergraduate. When I moved out to California, I looked Andy up. Uh, we've, we've been best friends since. And he said, hey, my dad knows the executive producer of Hawaii Five-0. And if we write a treatment, uh, they'll read it. So we sat down and just threw a treatment together of an idea called the capsule kidnapping. Uh, and literally a day later, they said, we love it. We want to make it. And so next thing, you know, do you have a script? You know, sure we do. We sat down, wrote a script. So it just it was just good timing uh, that got us then into the guild and said, oh, we've been paid to do this. Let's do this again. And this was your first collaboration with Jim Cash? No, this was the Anderson House, Andy House, oh. a different partner. Uh, okay. Jim I had met at Michigan State. He was my screenwriting instructor who oh, taught me basic formatting and, and things like that. And we had stayed in touch. Uh, but we, because I lived in California and Jim lived in uh, East Lansing, Michigan, you know, we, we didn't write together at that time. It was later that we uh, decided to try a project together. First of all, that's a fascinating dynamic um, of, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the kind of mentor um, philosophy, you know, especially like I've had great mentors in my career and um, it really is kind of this, this undervalued, underestimated secret weapon in success is being able to learn and be open to learning from people that have more experience than you and, and, and genuinely want to see you succeed. Was that always the relationship between you guys? Like, that's an interesting thing. I didn't really, because typically writing partners are buddies, right? They're, they're coming up from the same kind of level of experience and they're sort of learning together. I think this is one of the first times I've heard this concept of a professor and a student kind of collaborating together and then having a really long career doing it. Well, what had happened is that uh, Jim was a novelist and writing novels and also, you know, just interest in television and scripts. And when he heard that I had moved up to California and been successful, he had suggested we write together. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until a couple of years that we decided to do it. I, I admired his work. He admired the films I, I made. So it was sort of like we we got to know each other after the class and uh and you know i just really admired the way he put words on paper yeah and you know and then it's again it's luck i went back to michigan to pick up my motorcycle and drive it out to california and oh look wow. jim uh, look jim up at, at michigan state we met at the union grill and you know we pitched out like six ideas of which none of them sort of struck me and then riding cross country 
I, you know, you got a lot of time to, to sort of free associate yeah. uh, and just said, oh, I get that idea now. And when I got to California, I said, let's do this. Let, let's 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 see if we can make this thing work. And we had to learn how to write cross country because it wasn't the Internet at that time. And, sure. you know, the AT&T phone calls were really expensive. Yeah, so yeah. we had to be very specific about working together. And it took us because I also had other jobs. I was. I was a crew person at that time. I was earning my living, paying my rent by being an assistant cameraman, also a cameraman on different, you know, small independent little documentaries or little little shows, tiny things. Um, and so we would we took us about two and a half years and five drafts to get this the script that I thought should be at the level you could you could enter the industry at. And this script was Top Gun. No, 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 no. 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 This script was was called Izzy and Mo. It was mm -hmm. based on two prohibition agents in the uh, 20s, uh, and it was sort of a inspired by the sting, but a lot of sort of charm and chase fun, you know, just just a, a sort of adventure type story. Um, and it, it we were able to get an agent with that together. And then the agent was able to get uh, an option for that script. Mm -hmm. So we actually earned some money. It was a good option. And uh picture never got made. Uh, and that, that's pretty much what usually happens. Sure. Um, but because we had earned a pretty good option, we did another spec. And uh, that spec called Old Gold uh, went into auction uh, at that time. And in fact, I was actually an assistant cameraman in China uh, doing a documentary on China at that time in the late 70s. Oh, wow. When, when <laughs> we got the auction results and it was bought. Um, and, uh, and that, again, didn't go into production. But we had at least earned some money, got the script elevated us throughout the town. People started to know who we were. They were interested in our writing. Um, that Sorry to kind of get lost here for a second, but um, that, that documentary in China, um, because there was a documentary that I've seen in, about China in that same era. That's one of my most fascinating things I've ever seen. I saw it at the Film Forum in, in New York City years ago. And it was actually directed by Michelangelo Antonioni. This wasn't that same one, was it? No, no. This, oh, okay. is, about, <laughs> this is about education in China. And it was it was just, it was a small group that went over there. But it was fascinating to see China at that point in time. Oh, yeah, um, I can imagine. I very can imagine. amazing. When, when Beijing was a one-story one city, literally, with hutongs and, and uh, tractors and things like that in the city. It was it was quite, quite fascinating to get that insight at that point in time. And... and in your sort of early process of becoming a screenwriter, um, I've heard you mention things in other interviews about um, you like to keep working at it to get better at being a writer. As somebody who has written professionally as well, I feel like sometimes I've gotten worse as a writer. It, you know, it, it, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. I'm also a musician of sorts, and learning how to get better at music is quite like one, two, three, there's like a very specific process to it. What, how would you describe the kind of best um, sort of quote unquote practice methods to get better as a writer? Everybody says just write, but you can't just pick up a guitar and get better. Like you have to have a kind of a, a learning a plan in mind of what you want to try to get better at. Um, do you have any kind of suggestions for that? Well, I, I think it's a process and it's a it, it's a journey. So I think that one is you have to be patient and realize it's a marathon and it's a long haul. Mm -hmm. um, and because growth doesn't come overnight, it comes actually in small bits and pieces along the way. And there, I, I believe that you hit plateaus and then suddenly you break through a plateau. I think reading scripts is really important. Mm -hmm. Read writers that you admire is important. People who you like how they tell stories, how they put words in the page get a feeling for the rhythms of their stories. You know, how, how do they do it? And scene construction. I think what's tough about scripts is so many elements. There is not only the characters, the stories, there's the scenes, there's the theme. There's a lot of elements and it just takes time to learn how to do that on the big picture. Um, and it's just not going to come out all at once. Uh, and I also think it's important to have, I believe, uh, be in a writer's group. No one should be writing alone. It's very hard. And that's one of the things that being in a university environment allows you to have a writer's group of people to work with. But there's also writers wherever you are who are doing this. And it behooves anybody to form a writer's group so that you can get some feedback and just 
talk out your work in addition to just writing it. Yeah, interesting. Um, one, one thing about screenplays that, you know, because I've been writing scripts for a very long time, very few have gotten produced, but some have. Um, and, and like one thing that I always kind of get uh, lost in, and it's almost like day one every time I do it again, is kind of my approach to the scene descriptions. Um, you know, do, do you have a philosophy around the scene descriptions? I mean, like there's the kind of, you know, quote unquote rules, like don't make it longer than four words, never use like ING, you know, there, there's all the kind of stuff you read in books and you've learned in class. What What's your kind of approach to scene descriptions in screenplays? Okay, so my, let me, the two part, two part answer. First answer sure. is there are no rules. So anybody says his rules, there are none. There's only one rule, and Alfred Hitchcock, the famous director, said, you know, don't bore the audience. And I think, <laughs> and I think the most important thing to realize is that when you're writing a script, it's a reading experience. Hmm. It's, it's, it's so the person reading it is you want to have them stay involved in your story. Um, Damien Chazelle, the, the famous writer-director, had a great quote on an uh, um, interview with Terry Gross. Terry Gross said to him, Damien, you did a lot of rewrites before your success and worked on all sorts of different genres. Uh, and what did you learn from that? And he said, I learned how to get them to turn to the next page. Mm -hmm. I learned how to get them to read to the end. And I think as a screenwriter, something Jim and I worked on a lot, which was making sure our pages are really interesting. And as you're reading through it, you want to keep turning it. So in scene descriptions, I like to create an image. I like to set a setting of what, so the reader gets a picture in their mind and I like to keep it short and mm. not fill it up with anything more than, than, than they need. Uh, not too much detail, but enough. So I like color. I like the description of, of the environment. Uh, and I do like staging. People shouldn't just have sit and talk dialogue where there's nothing going on. How can I make so that there's movement in a scene? How can I make it so that there's energy in a scene? Mm. Uh, I'm looking to create that sort of thing. And also, you know, William Goldman says you you enter the scene as late as possible, you exit as early as possible. So always looking to cut heads and tails. Do I really need that two lines of dialogue in there? So I write long and then I go back and edit because, as you know, I'm very big on rewriting. So my first draft, I call the discovery draft. I really don't care what it looks like. I just want to discover who whose story this is, what the character, who the characters are. What are the stories that I can build upon? And if I can if I can allow myself the freedom to take chances and explore without having the pressure of it has to be perfect, it has to be right. But my first draft is for me. What do I gain from this? And then I have to get distance. And that's the key. And it's the hardest thing to do is get distance. I got to mm -hmm. step back, get away from it, go do something, get some time pass, um, get some notes from people I respect is really important. And then I have to basically sit down and read it myself in one sitting. And I'm a big believer in a hard copy. That I know because if you read online, you read your stuff, you read it on, on a PDF, you're going to skip. You're going to skim. But if you print it out in a hard copy, you can write notes on it. You can write notes to yourself and you can have a creative conversation with yourself as you're reading the script and responding to it. You're looking for one of the most important things is what works. What works is the most, okay, this is what's working. This, These are really good elements. I can mine these elements. And now when I go to my rewrite, I can focus more on this. Mm -hmm. What don't I like? Nah, this didn't work. It's really developed. Is it worthy? Or should I basically, what new ideas am I getting? All right. Mm -hmm. And and realizing the process of it, it's taking pressure off yourself to be perfect. You, you know, if you're good consistently, you're great. But if you're putting pressure to have an end result, that everything you write has to be brilliant. It can't be. You, you, you just can't. So let go, have fun with it, write the thing you want to write, and then step back and say, what works? What is the best part of this? And is it my intention? Because I think that's really critical. What mm -hmm. is my intention with the story? What do I want the reader, the audience to feel? Where am I taking them on this journey? And do you feel, um, first of all, so many cool little segues uh, flowing through my mind. First of all, just a little slight non sequitur. Uh, um, Adventures in Screenwriting was the very first film book I ever bought, um, you know, before I even graduated from high school. And like, I remember going to high school with my William Goldman Adventures in Screenwriting book. And, and I thought I had like the secret 
um, you know, right. weapon in my head, you know, like, cause like that book was just, I think I still have the copy of, uh, of my adventures in screenwriting books, you know, somewhere. Um, but going back to that concept, cause I think that's a really important one about what, what is my intention? What do I want the audience to walk away with? Right. Um, is that the kind of high concept philosophy that you kind of judge uh, every page by, every scene by? Like, what's the kind of resolution that you judge uh, whether it's working to that point? Well, even before I get to that point, I've got to really understand my story. I do a lot of pre-work before I start to writing. I really want to work things out. Um, I need to know the characters and the relationships. I'm a very big believer in finding a plot that will carry me through the story. But the real story is with relationships. The real story is between the people. The real story mm -hmm. is the subplots. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I try to make sure I have multiple lines of conflict. The, I mean, because my, my experience has taught me that you write the conflict. If you don't have conflict in your story, you don't have someone pushing against the main character throughout their journey, then you really, it's going to be difficult. So, but if I have conflict, multiple layers of conflict, then I can, I can basically plot out my story in a way I, I'm a card guy. So I use cards. I like to, I like to see my movie and, and before I start putting it on the page, if I can understand what the thrust of my story, then I, each scene has a specific purpose that will help, take me forward, move forward in terms of my story or s establish a lot of elements. Mm. Um, so getting, getting to um, the kind of, uh, you know, it's, and I hope I don't get some stuff wrong here because you have to kind of uh, put yourself in my shoes. When I was at NYU film school, there was a few heroes that we had back in those days. I mean, I'm so old that we still use steam bags and RE16s and, you know, like, like I was the last kind of class that really got to focus on, you know, scraping your emulsion and taping it together. And like, eventually it all graduated to like, you know, mini DV and stuff. But, you know, when I was in school, we had a few heroes, you know, and it was Akira Kurosawa. It was Stanley Kubrick. It was Igmar Bergman. It was Michelangelo Antonioni. And then there was another hero that everybody wanted to be like, and his name was Don Simpson. And, you know, I think that Don Simpson, um, all the stuff that I know about him is purely based around legend, you know? And at school, we used to have these amazing things where we would smoke cigarettes outside and say, high concept is the only true American art form because jo jazz is a genre. High concept is an actual school of art you know, beyond transcendentalism and all the stuff back from the Hudson River, you know, school, whatever. It was, we were that deep into the concept of Don Simpson and his and his idea of high concept. And the epitome of that is Top Gun, right? Like that the legend around campus, or really the legend around the Tisch School of the Arts, you know, when we were in film school, was that Don Simpson said, I want to make a movie about good looking fighter pilots. That was the inception, and then everything else kind of fell underneath that concept. But the more I'm, I've been doing a little bit of research into your career, it feels like maybe I have that whole story wrong, that you actually had a script that he found. Like, could you sort of clear up a little bit of this legend that I've held around with me for, for 30 years? Sure. So the, the way it came about, the way Top Gun came about was that uh, uh, Jim and I were working on Dick Tracy. Uh, at that time. And oh, wow, that early on. Yes, Dick Tracy oh, was wow. working in the early 80s, and it took 10 years to get it produced. So we had, we were working on Dick Tracy, and I met with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was the head of production uh, at that time for Paramount, and he was it was a co-production of Universal and Paramount. And Jeffrey wanted to have us do a, do a project for Paramount because uh, we were basically working for Universal at that time. So I had a, a breakfast meeting with Katzenberg and he said, there's six ideas in development. And one of them was Top Gun. Uh, I had my private pilot's license at that time. Uh, I oh, got wow. at Michigan State to a Spartan Flying Club. And I thought, well, that'd be sort of cool. Um, you know, if, if the movie doesn't get made, because nothing's getting made, <laughs> we're right. getting jobs and getting paid. Nothing's getting made. At least I get a flight out of it in a Navy jet. So, <laughs> right. 
you know, that's I a high concept in itself. I know, but it's actually true. I said, well, I got to get something special out of this project. But, you know, um, there was an article in the California magazine that basically just said there's a school that exists. And there were some photographs that were much more inspiring than the article. Um, and the article just said there's a school. There's no characters, no story, no plot, no anything. So it's sort of inspired by the article. So Jerry Bruckheimer had found it. He basically, with Simpson Bruckheimer, had optioned the article. And uh, I had to talk my partner into doing it because Jim didn't like airplanes and he was back in Michigan. I said, don't worry, buddy, I I'll fly. You won't fly. And I, I met with Don and Jerry and, and we all agreed there's a movie here. Um, but one of the conditions, first condition was if we can't get the planes from the Navy, I don't want to do it. If we cannot do it in advance because otherwise it's not, it's not going to be anything. Mm -hmm. So we basically using the uh, a lobby from the Motion Picture Assi uh, Association, we went back to Washington, went to the Pentagon, met with admirals, pitched wow. our, our, our idea with Don and Jerry. Uh, Jim didn't come. He doesn't travel. Uh, and they said, yes. OK, they liked it because we were pitching it as these young American heroes uh, had nothing about good looking guys, young American heroes. Um, and that was the, the first agreement, you know, first thing uh, uh, that I said, we, you know, we have to do this. The second was we were in demand at that time because we just finished Dick Tracy. We had a script that we did called Whereabouts that uh, John Landis was going to direct at that time. He was talking mm -hmm. to Robert Redford about it. So there was a lot of heat around our career and a lot of interest. So I said to Don and Jerry, look, we'll do this, but you got to leave us alone. We, we will just, we have to have time to figure this thing out and we will deliver you a script. Mm. So we didn't pitch them ideas. We didn't sit in the room and develop. We didn't, we just went off by ourselves. I went down to the base, interviewed about 25 pilots. Uh, we had a, uh, the, the military gave us Pete Pettigrew, who was a former um, uh, Top Gun pilot and Top Gun instructor, as well as a MIG killer in Vietnam. And he was our technical advisor. I did my jet flights. Uh, I went and did all sorts of training exercises, had to swim in the pool with a pack, had to go in a helo dunker, and, which I got ideas from. And one of the training exercises, they said, when if you eject, because a lot of it was concerned about ejection, be careful because the, there can be some debris above the cockpit. Right. Which I said, ooh, good idea. Write that down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very unexpected. So, 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 uh, um, not to interrupt, but uh, no, did ahead. you fly up in like the JT thirty eight in the in the actual Tomcat or or one of the training jets? Yeah, the Tomcat was classified. I could look at it, but I couldn't climb into it. Mm. So, looking at it, I was. It, it, it's a beautiful airplane. It just looks oh like it's flying when it's standing still. And but what got me excited was, and I didn't I didn't know about this until I got down there, was that there were there were there were two people in the plane. There's your pilot and there's your Rito, Rio in the back, radar yeah. intersect officer, which to me said, oh, there's a relationship between these pilots. That's yeah. really interesting because now for me, I'm, as a writer, I'm looking for the conflict. What's the story? I mean, here's these planes going to school. So what's the story? Mm. Who are the characters? Um, and I took my jet ride. And after I got my jet ride, uh, it was an amazing experience because it was physical. Right. It's not right. like anything we, anything we'd ever want to do on an aircraft because we're pulling eight G's. We're doing high speed turns. We're doing wow. all these barrel rolls. They're putting they're putting me through all the, the moves. You know, they kept saying we're not supposed to do this. But, you know, and then they go do let's, some other crazy. Let's thing. kill. Yeah, let's kill some dinosaurs. I've heard yeah, that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But it changed the movie concept for me because I came back and called Jim and I said, these guys are like athletes. This is an amazingly physical experience. It's mm. not just flying. It's that they're flying in these G's and what it does in terms of pulling your blood out and you have to, you know, can't gray out and pass out. And these turns, the sense of speed became a huge part of this. And taking those rides helped us create, with Pete Pettigrew's help, the engagements. Each engagement is very specifically drawn for a different type of engagement. So it's not the same. It's not a repeat. And each one develops maverick's character in terms of what happens to him uh and how it advances the story but, wow i'm sorry did, did yeah. You have your... yeah i was gonna say but one of the big problems i was facing was these guys all got along 
So right. they're all getting along. And I'm going, well, okay, where's the conflict? I, I can't <laughs> do a story about people all like each other. Right. And then I thought, oh, I'm looking at the F-14. What if one guy is sort of not getting along? What happens if you create a character and she's not going along with the program? And it became, okay, that's the main source of conflict. The group that everybody's working together, except one guy is bumping against the rest of them. And that's right, where right. the conflict comes in. And that's that's where Maverick, the, the core idea of creating that character who's a, against the grain, came from and, and one other fascinating thing um of of reality versus a necessary device in storytelling to your point is that you know i'm kind of an aviation nut also so like you know i i i appreciate because i saw the original top gun just recently and even some of the language like angels 11 and and people speaking about altitude and using the correct words and it's just the attention to detail the word Rio showing up and all these things. Um, but one, one fascinating thing about uh, Top Gun, the real sort of naval, uh, you know, pilot training court center, whatever they call it, um, is that there is no Top Gun trophy, right? Everybody that, that, that graduates from the class, they all get a similar plaque to the one that's shown in the movie. Um, but you added this amazing, like friendly competition of just who is the best in the class that doesn't really make you enemies, but there is that kind of healthy competition element. How did you decide uh, to add that? And did you get a little pushback from the Navy saying, hey, we don't really do that kind of thing here? Um, no. So let me let me get to that. First off, the language. When yes. I was interviewing the pilots, I couldn't understand a word they were saying because they were talking <laughs> right. all of these right. all these right. uh, uh, you know shortcut phrases. And yet it was so much a part of it that Jim and I made a decision that we're going to do the same thing. We're not going to tell the audience what these things mean. Right. We're just going to speak in the language so that it's realistic. And we had our technical advisor, Pete Pettigrew, help us. Um, and it was a decision we made early on. But in terms of telling a dramatic story, again, what's the conflict? Where is the tension? Right. And and so we didn't want to do about, you know, I mean, it's very tough to write a school story. People sitting right. in rooms, you know, reading books. You don't see a lot of them, right? Yeah. So we had to basically find the dramatic line. And that was we created the Top Gun Trophy as, as a sense of graduation and a sense who's going to win the trophy, which created the sense of competition. Right. And right. We, we drew, as writers, we drew from our own lives. I, I played ice hockey at a, at a fairly high level. Uh, I was a goaltender. I even got to practice with the Kings on, on two occasions when oh, nice. uh, they need a fill in goaltender. So, you know, you, you want to be on the ice. You don't be sitting on the bench. So, you know, I had that Jim was a quarterback in high school. You want to be leading the team. You want to be sitting on the bench. So for us, we just sort of reached down and said, you know, there's no points for second place. And that's just who these guys are, which is who they really are. They're very competitive people, but right. in truth, not against each other. But they are competitive in terms of how they see life and just the type of personalities they are. Did you did you get to work with um, a fighter pilot around that time whose call sign was Slapshot? Uh, no, I didn't know. Oh, okay, because it, it just reminded because like you said hockey, and uh, his call sign was Slapshot, and he actually was at Top Gun in 1985, um, and uh, he said that the call signs are actually given to you by your friends. Like you rarely come up with your own call sign. They're usually gifted to you. You never come up with your own call sign. It, oh. it, it, there's a story that they told me there was a guy that came in, new guy and he in, in terms of squadron, he said his call sign is shark. And they said, no, <laughs> <laughs> your, call, your call sign is minnow. <laughs> minnow. <laughs> and he was throughout his whole career, he was minnow. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. That is awesome because yeah, you figure like, yeah, you know, my call sign is going to be this, but no, it right. doesn't work that way. You know, no, they put a call sign on you, and, and you got you're stuck with it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. So, okay, so I would be remiss if I don't ask a little bit about this, just because he was so like, I worked at a company called uh, Rockstar Games uh, back in the early days of my career, and we became famous because we made a game called Grand Theft Auto. Uh, three and Grand Theft Auto Vice City, and you know these were these became very very popular games, and our kind of patron saint was Don Simpson, and and we had a big Don Simpson poster in the office, and and you know we all kind of had this weird fascination with this guy without really knowing much about him, because back then there was like three articles written about him, 
he only had like five or six movies, right? Like, you know, there wasn't a ton of stuff about him, but he had this legendary status. You as somebody that actually collaborated with him and worked with him, what was Don Simpson like? Well, I, mean, I think the thing about Don is Don really knew movies. He knew what a movie was. And, and, and it, it might sound strange, but, you know, what's a movie and how do you put a movie together? And, and, and very much engaged in, in the sense of scope and scale to engage an audience. So, you know, Don, uh, he, he had a real feeling for these elements. Um, I think, you know, the, the best he gave me the best line a producer ever gave me. Oh, wow. I, I, I dropped off the script to Jerry. I mean, it was one of these Hollywood things. I dropped off the script to Jerry on the outside of the gates of Bel Air one night. It was finally done. Um, and uh, I said, think Tom Cruise when you read this, because we had written it for Tom and mine. And days oh, later, wow. but two days later, I get this phone call from Don Simpson. And Don, in his voice, says, I will kill to get this movie made. <laughs> oh, my God. Which is really, I said, Don, I don't think you should go that far, but I'm really happy you're excited about it. Because, again, <laughs> at this time, we had not had anything produced. Right, nothing had right. been in production. So we, we've, we've gotten all this sort of support, but nothing's going for the cameras. That So that's amazing. So you're telling me that when you were writing the, 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 the script, before anybody had mentioned it, uh, before any attachments were made, you were writing with Tom Cruise in mind. Yes. I, I basically was watching Tom's career. I thought he, you know, I thought he stole so many movies and he was just up and coming guy, young guy. And part of the, the Maverick character we created, you know, Maverick's a bit of a jerk. So you've got to get an actor who you like, who you're going to root for, even though he's, you know, not, you know, he's not doing the things <laughs> at times he should be doing. He's out for himself. And I thought that Tom at that time sort of embodied the, what I call the young American, just this sort of this, you know, this ambition, this push, this drive, and a little bit of an edge to him, you know what I mean? A little bit out for himself a little bit. Uh, and they read it and they said, yeah, Tom's the guy. And he was always the only one ever considered for it. And I think I can't imagine anybody else in that role. That's awesome. And, and just out of curiosity, because the the relationship between Tom uh, or Maverick and Goose, uh, Anthony Edwards, was, was such a strong relationship of friendship of of even i think even to this day watching it the thing the nuance that gets me the most about the relationship is that even when there is a bad thing that happens as a result of one of the friends typically maverick the other friend approaches it with a oh well that sucks but you know we're going to get through it type of attitude you know like it was a very supportive constructive friendship right there wasn't really a lot of conflict between them right there was more um, an effort to to build the relationship stronger what what when you were writing that part was there somebody you had in mind for for goose no the only person we had in mind was really tom we we the casting was amazing anthony edwards was a brilliant cast and i think the yeah. casting director on that film did an amazing role you know casting directors don't get enough uh uh you know, support and and, and uh, respect because they do an amazing amount of work, and, and the cast that was put together was just outstanding. Yeah, you know, my 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 next guest on the show is actually Harold. Um, kind of, I don't want to say his name wrong. Fadelmeyer, um, mm -hmm. the the composer. Did you work with him at all during during the creation? Because their music, and, and this is a, a a kind of a hallmark of '80s cinema, I think. Yeah. That sort of uh, um, um, you know music became such a an integral part of the storytelling you know like and, and bespoke music specifically and you know Fadelmeyer is such a legend of those type of catchy scores was that something that you had in mind when you were writing the script was how music plays into it we we, we wrote the script we did write some scenes with some songs into it you know some uh, um just, just in terms of some rock and roll, because we always felt that it was, you know, it, it, it's definitely, I think Tony Scott said it best when he read the script. He said, it's rock and roll in the sky. And, you know, and it really wow. was it. And and Simpson Bruckheimer at that time really understood, especially in the 80s, how you did have to have a good soundtrack and use a soundtrack to promote the movie. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously they'd done flash dance, you know, a lot of great music there. So they understood the importance of music in terms of the film. And I thought they, they did, the music work was amazing. The original songs and and just the sense of the score and how it just supported the film. Yeah, and, and um, 
you know, you mentioned the great late uh, Tony Scott. Um, was was Tony collaborative with you once he took uh, over the script? I mean, did you have ongoing sort of rewrite responsibilities or being on set type of stuff, collaborating with Tony as the movie was getting made? You know, actually, we, we met with Tony, and, and uh, Tony's a high-energy guy. I mean, just great, really just amazing he was, and it's just, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're all heartbroken. Um but when it went into production, we had a, 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 here's what happened. It was a very strange situation. We basically presented the script with Simpson Bruckheimer to the executives of Paramount, and they sort of just didn't get it. They mm. literally didn't get the movie. And, That's amazing. They, and they decided at that time not to go into production with it. Wow. Put it up on the shelf. And of course, we're heartbroken because I mean, what do I have to do to get a movie made? You know, we had Dick Tracy on it that <laughs> fell apart. Now Top Gun's not getting made. And so our agents put us in touch on the next project with Ivan Reitman, who is the hottest director in the world. He just come through Ghostbusters. And Ivan had a project he wanted to do, and we were hired on to do that project because I could sit and wait. The movie didn't go in production. So when Top Gun went into production, unfortunately, we were on, on the um, – writing uh, uh, legal eagles mm. and we're not available to do the onset production rewrites. Nice. Understood. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. So it's frustrating to us because they called NASA to do it and Ivan would not let us out of our contract because he, he wanted to get a movie made and, and uh, yeah, there's yeah, a was... strike coming up. So it was, it was very frustrating to us um, not to be able to be there and just work, work those final rewrites. We did, we did a set of rewrites for Simpson Bruckheimer. They had, you know, every script goes through rewrites. It's just, it's, it's the process. Sure, sure. Um, what one um, one last thing on on Top Gun? Um, did you in, ever get to interact with Tom as he was? Because you're a pilot, Tom is a pilot. Tom Tom Cruise like owns his own P fifty one Mustang, flies actual fighter jets, the GT thirty eight. I mean, this is a a real pilot, you know. Um, did you and him ever get a chance to sort of chat when you were, uh, uh, you know, in the early days of that, of that we show? Did, yes, we did get a chance to to meet and, and chat about the movie. He was very excited about it. Um, and, it, it, you know, and Tom, especially at that time, I haven't seen him since, was very humble and very excited. You know, a young guy, super young guy to be yeah. taking on that role. So, but it's, so, you know, some of the fun stories. Tom initially didn't want to do the movie. Mm. He just didn't sort of get it. And his agency wanted him to do it. And, and so they said, look, let's have let's give Tom a flight. So he went up <laughs> to Point Magoo and he drives up in his motorcycle. He just finished uh, Legend, uh, Ridley Scott. His hair is down to here and he's not a movie star. So these pilots look at this guy and they go like, who is this guy? So <laughs> they took him up and they do like what they like to do is it's shake you around and, you know, make you throw up all of yourself. And it's sort of a pilot's idea of a good time. And and. They did that with Tom, and he came out of it and said, "This is the greatest thing in the world. I got to do this movie." Wow! And, and this is before he was a pilot, right? This is before. Yes, he right. Actually... That's how that's how Tom got into it. Exactly. That's amazing. And, and first of all, it's such an a, an amazing little nuance that he did Legend with Ridley Scott right, right. before that, and then worked with Tony right after that. You know, yeah. two of the greatest sort of sibling talents. You know, uh, it's just you know like amazing stuff. Um, we're, you know, like I want to be conscious of your time, um, but another movie that you did that also has an amazing kind of mimetic musical theme to it. And one of my kind of like favorite movies when I was a kid is The Secret of My Success with Michael J. Fox. Um, this movie, for some reason, was like it's one of those movies that when I was a kid kind of taught me that anything is possible if you kind of put your mind to it. And sometimes you have to invent your own reality, even if you know that it's not real, you know, and that somehow that kind of persistence will make it real. Right. And, you know, many great authors tackle this theme. Jorge Luis Borges also is very much into this concept. Tell me a little bit about the the sort of the the birthing of the secret of my success. Well, it was uh, um, it was at Universal. Um, uh, we were working with Frank Price over there as the head of production, and they had a movie that was going in production. They needed a, a rewrite really fast. Um, and literally, they had Michael J. Fox. He, they had to start on like a certain day in July and end in a certain day of August because he was on, I think, Family Ties. So he had small right. windows. 
and they were going to shoot whatever they had and they didn't they didn't they didn't feel what they had was ready yet so we jumped in and uh, we had an idea that we had pitched to Frank called First Jobs. And he said, well, why don't you wind it into this movie? And we said, yeah, okay. So we created that whole double identity story. I'm a huge fan of Billy Wilder. And Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Wilder is sort of the the person I would always go to to say, okay, how do you do this project? Uh, So this was like Jim and I are homage to Billy Wilder and have fun with a dual identity character. And also just deal with the business world because business world is never dealt with. And you know, why would you want to be involved, you know, run a big company and stuff like that? It seemed like it was OK, you know. Um, so we just do- dove in and did this huge rewrite in the script in, in, a, in a short period of time uh, mm-hmm. and then had a great director, Herb Ross, who yeah. was a who was a, a Broadway director and also a filmmaker. But uh, and Herbert really loved the written word. So it was great to see is that he what was on the page he shot. And mm-hmm. uh, and that's not always the case. Uh, so. Uh, and it was just fun. It was just fun to play that double identity character and just play a comedy and also writing it for Michael J. Fox, knowing that this is the actor. He's going to go out there. And and how can we create these scenes for Michael? We know. He's yeah. Going to and it's like such a kind of like, a, like, um, you know, almost spoiled at this point because you get to work with Tom Cruise at his peak. And now you got Michael J. Fox coming off of maybe the greatest year that any single actor has ever had because he had the number one show on television. He had the number one movie in the theaters with Back to the Future. And I believe that he's the only actor of of all time to have number one, to have two number one movies and a number one TV show all running at the same time because he also had Teen Wolf um, in that same year. And I believe Secret of My Success was literally his next film after that. Yes. Yes. Did, did you get to work ever with Michael J. Fox? No, because I was shot in New York. And basically, you know, as a screenwriter, sitting on a set and being there in New York, it's just it's it's, you know, we're on to the next project. I mean, right. we were really in demand. And so we would finish we'd finish one project and we'd be hired to the next one um, yeah. and something else. And uh, uh, so it was like we're just we're moving ahead. Um, so so speaking of moving ahead, um Another one of these kind of film school like obsessions that we had was with a cinematographer named uh, Vittorio Storaro. And Vittorio Storaro got to work with another great legendary director. I still think Reds is one of the best movies that I've ever seen in my life in terms of how it takes the genre of a documentary of a kind of an oral history and creates this epic narrative dramatic masterpiece around it. And eventually this project that you started before Top Gun, Dick Tracy gets picked up by this legendary Hollywood icon, Warren Beatty, who's going to now bring all of his style and class into it. And I believe it was an excellent movie. Uh, When I was a little kid, it was one of those weird franchises that nobody really was expecting much out of, but it, it just kind of took over everything. Um, how, how, what was it like to finally, after such a long time of working on this project, not only to get it made, but to get it made by guys like Vittorio Storaro and, and, and Warren Beatty. I mean, like, that's like, you know, with all due respect, a few steps up from, from, from Landis. Um, you know, what's interesting, we worked on four, with four directors. John oh, Landis wow. started the, John Landis started the project. Walter Hill then came on board. Uh, I learned a lot from Walter because Walter was a writer, editor, director. And Walter taught me a lot. I, I came away from that a better writer from working with Walter Hill. Um, and uh, and then it went to Dick Benjamin, uh, who at that time was actor, director, directing some things. And then basically it, it once again just died. Uh, mm-hmm. And Warren ended up coming in, picking up the rights. The rights had, had basically... Um, uh, expired and he picked up the rights and moved the project from Universal Paramount to Disney uh, mm-hmm. at that point in time. Uh, and then we, you know, did some uh, work with, with Warren. Um, I mean, amazing filmmaker. You look at his work, his body work as a filmmaker, not just as an actor, this, the, the movies he's done, he's just, he's remarkable. So he really is. He really is. Yeah. And, and he's and, only done a few movies, right? Like, uh, you know, heaven can wait and right. Um, Reds, you know, Dick Tracy, Bullworth. He doesn't have a uh, shampoo, I believe he did all, or hair. And, and, and Bullworth is a great movie. I mean, it really oh, is. 
Oh, it's one of those great. things that somehow has been forgotten, but it's a great political movie. <laughs> oh, it really is great. Yeah. Um, did, when, when, when Warren picked the project back up, did he want you to get in there with him and sort of help massage it, or were you pretty much off of it by that point? I was pretty much off of it. We had some meetings. We had this, some discussions about it. Um, but, you know, again, it, it's like we were not sitting around. You know, I mean, we, we were in deep in the middle of projects. Um, but right. it's pretty much shot. I mean, the biggest difference and the thing I struggle the most with it, because we weren't there to do a, a last pass, is that, I mean, you can't complain about Stephen Sondheim's music. I mean, wow. Right. You know, it's it's great. But it it feels tight to me, like this all this music, like its story needed to be thinned out a little bit because mm. I think that it gets a little thick at places. Um, mm. But the visual style of what Warren did with it and the people he brought in and, and getting, you know, Dustin Hoffman to do a bit piece as mumbles, which we did write all that dialogue as a mumble. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Was, yeah, Al Pacino was great. I, yeah. Madonna was at her peak. I mean, this was a, this was a, a beautiful moment in cinema that is like – Kind of forgotten to a certain degree, but yep. but still very powerful. It's interesting. People just went at the, the re critics and reviewers just went at the movie. They just were mercilessly about it, and uh, I, I don't quite understand. It was hyped so big, and and Disney right. had this huge release, and I think there was a pushback against all the hype about it. But I just don't think it ever got. I mean, people liked it that saw it. They enjoyed the movie. One thousand percent, and and like I think that for us. You know, like as like kids that wanted to make movies, there was this, and I might get this wrong, but that somehow Vittorio Storaro literally only used a certain palette of primary colors in the movie. Um, and like, it's like one of these movies, like talk about a high concept where it's just like, it's so strict around a, vis, you know, like, like around a lexicon of visuals um, and, and really I don't know, just a beautiful, you know, film, you know, congratulations. Did, did, did you feel like this was a kind of an ending of a cycle in your life when you had started out with this project and then many years later actually saw it finish? Like, what did you feel when you actually got to see it on the screen? Well, I mean, it, it's exciting to see it finally mounted. Um, mm. you know, and it's, it, it's, it's finally in the theater. Here's this thing we wrote almost 10 years earlier that still stayed alive for that moment. Cause most stuff just, you know, after 10 years, it, it's gone somewhere and hidden. And, and yet this, this thing came alive. I also, one of the things I really admired that Warren did is he was trying to capture the comic strip, a sense of a color palette. That's a palette is those primary colors that is with a lot of yellows and reds. Mm that you would see in a comic strip. And he really tried to, you know, hearken back to that. There are shots where, where it is framed just as if it's a, a, a you know, a, a panel out of, of the comic strip. Yeah. And I think he also was being very respectful to Chester Gould, who created uh, Dick Tracy, who was an amazing for research. Cause I, I, I wasn't a huge Tracy fan. My partner was, and he said, I, we got to do this. I said, all right, okay. And I was able to get printed, strips from the very beginning 1929 all up to the mid 50s and i read all the strips like it was a book to understand it better wow. uh, and then we just lifted characters and stuff and john landis had said i want to set in the 30s around big boy caprice and that was our marching orders and then john let us go write the movie he let us go and figure it out which we really appreciated that sort of freedom so similar you know to maverick as we're sort of wrapping up here um um Maverick was this, you know, great fighter pilot. And then most people, and this is actually a true, uh, a true thing. Most people that go to Top Gun as students, the real prize is to become an instructor. You're now an instructor over at USC. What, what's, what's the one message um, that you try to imbue upon your students that are coming through in such a highly competitive and, you know, very small chance for success industry. Like, what is it that you're trying to ultimately teach your students? To tell a really good story, yes. to engage the audience, to also, I think one of the most important things is to be kind to yourself as a creative person. Mm. That, you know, creative people tend to be very self-critical and that doesn't help your work. And to just understand it's a process, to, to allow yourself to go on the journey and you will continue to grow as long as you're open and learning. 
and there are no there are no rules really. There, it's not like you have to do this at this page, you do this that page. The most important thing are good characters. Mm-hmm. Why am I invested in this story? Why do I care about what 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 are my fears? What are the things I I'm, I'm frightened about? Because the audience is asking questions throughout the story all the time. They're going, well, what's happening here? What's going to happen with this relationship? What's going to go on here? And so creating questions throughout your story is keeps people interested in it. And mm-hmm. also, I think most important is, why is it important to you? Right. What is it about? Where are you in this story, some way, shape, or form? And it doesn't have to just be all autobiographical, but it's maybe about movies you love. It's type of genre you want to work in. And you're just going to, you know, just get there and have fun with it. I know it's work and it's a grind. But also rewrite. You're going to have to be a rewriter. It's yeah. it's it's that's a, the essential part of writing is rewriting. Yeah, yeah. One one of um one of your books. It's one of my favorite titles of a screenwriting book because the talk about high concept. It's like the entire message is in the is in the is in the title. And I I I believe I don't want to butcher it, but I believe your book is called Screenwriting Is Rewriting. That is correct. Like, yes, and and that is such a such a true thing, you know, because even this morning I was looking at a, like at a script that I worked on um, because somebody's interested in it. And again, because of a certain somebody who's been in the news and on a trial was interested back in the old days. Anyway, I was like rereading it today. And it's almost like talking to somebody you haven't talked to in so long. And like every single word I'm looking at, I'm like, Oh, maybe I should change this one. Or if I got a dot, you know, and it's like I've rewritten that thing like a hundred times, you know, and it's uh, such a such an interesting um, thing. Um, but, Jack, this has been amazing that I can keep asking you questions because um, I believe that you have a lot you know, to share with people with this incredible ambition to do this incredibly difficult thing. So in any case, I appreciate the time you've given me today and uh, sorry for some of those little technical hiccups at the beginning. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Is there any is there any place that you would like to send my listeners to, like uh, a book that you might have or anything like that, or or just enroll to USC for the full you know for the full show? Yes, I mean you know I, I just I, I wish all your listeners well, and if they're writers, just stay at it, believe in yourself. It's going to take time, um, and you know it's it's about telling the story you want to tell, um, and just it's going to take time. It's a journey. But Mark, it's been a pleasure talking with you. It's been fun. Uh, cool. I wish you the best, too. All right. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you guys for uh, for tuning in. And we will see you on the next one.